So hello, everyone. Welcome to the session on strategies for managing a hybrid classroom. My name is Stephanie Richter. I am the Director of Teaching Excellence and Support in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. CITL is available to help with anything related to your teaching or teaching with technology, uh, whether that is the classroom technology right now or something like Blackboard or Kaltura. We have a whole host of learning technologies available for you to use with your students. And CITL will help both with your pedagogical uh, strategies as well as your technology strategies and choices. So please feel free to reach out to us with any of those questions. I want to start by directing you to our flexible teaching site. It is at flexteaching.niu.edu and I'm going to grab the link and put it into the text chat for all of you who are joining the session live. But those of you watching the recording, it's just flexteaching.niu.edu. This site has a, a number of guides and resources related to designing, planning, and, and delivering your courses, whether those are online, in person or a hybrid in between. So the Flex Teaching site came out of our Keep Teaching efforts in March of 2020 with the, the notion that what we have all learned from teaching remotely can help us build more resilient course designs so that in the future we can shift a course more easily from in person to online or back again, as well as implementing some hybrid course delivery options as well. So these strategies and guides really apply to whatever type of teaching you're doing. And there is the guide to hybrid course delivery is brand new and added this um, this summer. So I definitely encourage you to check out those resources. I want you to start the session, though, as you're thinking about your managing a hybrid classroom. Think about how um, your approach and how you can start with a less is more strategy. When, you, when you're starting with a new technology or starting with a new um, teaching technique, it's tempting to try everything at once. But what we know is that using a few, few tools really well is actually a better choice than using a lot of them and ending up spread too thin or making things too complicated for your students. The more times that they need to log in somewhere, the different sites they need to go to, it's going to make their learning journey uh, more complex and they will be focusing on those um, logistics instead of on the content. So less is more, use what you need to be effective and try to limit uh, as much as you're trying to take on as well so that you don't overwhelm yourself. So less is more. That's my, my first strategy for you to think about. But we're here to talk about hybrid course delivery. So I'm going to start with the nuts and bolts of how you deliver a course in a hybrid manner. And in this case, I'm using hybrid to refer to having students in person and online simultaneously. So you have essentially two audience of students that you're teaching to at the same time. I also want to point out that this is something that in, um, in some cases is a, a strategy that the university is using to deliver courses to more students. In other cases, however, and in the majority of cases, this is going to be instead a strategy that you choose to adopt, not one that's mandated, when you're trying to accommodate students who need to uh, usually take a medical leave from your classroom for some reason. Right now, that's likely to be for COVID, but of course, there have been other reasons in the past and there will continue to be reasons in the future why students may need to take a, a short leave from being in your class in person physically and using a hybrid delivery mode may help you to uh, continue that student's learning during that time. When you are teaching a hybrid course, you are essentially going to be teaching in person and via web conferencing simultaneously. So you may be broadcasting, you may be recording, you may do both. And we would recommend using one of the web conferencing tools we have available on campus for all NIU faculty, staff, and students to use. Right now, that is Blackboard Collaborate, Zoom Meetings, and Microsoft Teams. All three are available to you. Blackboard Collaborate is integrated that 
the closest with Blackboard, but Zoom and Teams also have tools in Blackboard available. And then Zoom and Teams, you can also log into directly and access from outside of Blackboard. But after a year of remote teaching and of quarantining and of staying at home, we are all much more familiar with these tools than we have been in the past, which is actually going to work, I think, to all of our advantages going forward. Once you've launched your session, whatever tool you happen to be using, this is a screenshot from Collaborate to start, you're going to want to enable your camera and microphone in that session. We'll talk more in a minute about what cameras and microphones are available in the classrooms, but once you turned on your camera and microphone, the students who are remote will be able to see and hear uh, what's going on in the classroom. How much they can see in here, what they can see in here, will depend on specifically what cameras and microphones are in the room that you're in. And again, we'll talk about that more. Most of these tools have an initial setup when you first come in where you choose what camera or microphone you may want to use. But if you find that your audio or your video is not being broadcast, you can configure those devices as well. So in Collaborate, as we talked about at the beginning of this session, the side panel has a gear icon where you can configure your audio and your video inputs. In Zoom, you, in your toolbar, you would unmute and start video using the camera and microphone uh, icons in the left side of that toolbar. Excuse me, left side of the toolbar. But then you can also configure which specific camera or microphone you are using with the little caret uh, symbols, these like, um, small up arrows, those open a menu where you can then choose to which camera or which microphone you want to use in the session at that time. In Teams, when you first launch the session, you're asked if you want to enable your audio or your video, so you can enable them at that time, or you can enable them once you are into the session. And then in both, or in Teams, you can configure both options using the gear icon or the slider icon. I'm not sure why they're different. They app open the exact same side panel where you can choose your uh, microphone or the camera that's connected to your computer. And again, the choice that you make will depend on what's in your room. And we'll talk in a minute about how you know what's in your room and what you should be using in those spaces. Once you've done that, then we recommend sharing your content. If well, your, if your content is on your computer, then you'll want to share your application or share your screen. And that might be a PowerPoint, it might be a website, it might be another software program, like a specialized uh, program or application that your students are learning to use. You may also want to use your camera as the primary content. For I gave an example here of using a document camera, but this would also apply if you are uh, giving a demonstration, uh, something physical or a, a theater and dance um, performance, or if you just wanted to show yourself or your students to the remote students as the primary content, uh, as the primary thing that the students remotely are going to be watching. But in that case, you're actually sharing a camera as content as opposed to something like an application share as your content. The, the third option that I actually forgot to put on this slide is using a, a marker board or a dry erase board. In most of the classrooms, the cameras don't pick up the dry erase boards very well, and so you would want to instead share a digital whiteboard. I do believe I have some slides on that as another third option, perhaps, for the content that you want to share. Now that we have everything shared so that our remote students can see and or hear it, you may want to start the recording. So in each of the three web conferencing tools, you can start and stop a recording. Um, recording is optional if you have students joining live. You don't have to record. You could also record without having any students live. That might be useful if instead of broadcasting to students remotely, you want to record class and make it available for students. You can actually use web conferencing to, effect, to essentially record the class in, even if you don't have any students watching it live. So in Collaborate, 
and in Teams, those are automatically saved in the cloud. Collaborate saves within Collaborate in Blackboard. Teams is going to save the recording to either Stream or to OneDrive. And in Zoom, you have the option to record to the computer or to the cloud. And in a classroom, I recommend recording to cloud because if you record it to the classroom, you're going to have to wait for it to process, transfer that video to somewhere else, such as uploading it to OneDrive or putting it on a flash drive. And with limited time between classes um, scheduled in a room, you may not be able to do that effectively or you may feel rushed. Your students are probably waiting to ask some questions after class or talk to you. And you'll be much, it'll be much smoother if you record to the cloud when you're using Zoom instead of the computer. That being said, you do have limited storage in Zoom. So you may need to mid-semester find that, or you may find mid-semester that your Zoom storage is full and you'll want to record or download those recordings and move them to Kaltura or to OneDrive in O365 instead so that your students can still watch those and access them, but you can free up space in Zoom then for new recordings to come in. Just something to keep an eye out depending on how many courses you're teaching, how often you're recording to Zoom, and how long your class sessions are. Any questions on web conferencing before we move to, to classroom equipment? And I can talk about what's actually in the rooms that you're in. So now's a great time if you have a question and you want to raise your hand using the hand icon to use your microphone to ask, or if you'd like to use the text chats, um, feel free to post your question there too. I'll pause for a minute to give you a chance to do that. All right, seeing no questions this time, let's go ahead and move on to our next section. And that is looking at classroom equipment. So the Division of IT has been working campus-wide, really, on a wider uh, variety of classrooms than they've ever worked on before to provide updated or upgraded equipment in classrooms in order to facilitate live streaming. Many of our classrooms on campus have had a uh, have had a, a lengthy time since they were last updated. And so that process has been more challenging than expected. There have also been some supply chain issues we'll talk about that have uh, limited the upgrades that have occurred. But we still have, Division of IT rather, still has upgrades planned in the future. You're probably more concerned about what's going on in your classrooms right now, though. Uh, and Laurel, your question is a great one. Once you've loaded a Zoom recording into Kaltura, you can, yes, delete them from the Zoom cloud storage. You'll have already downloaded it as well, so you'll have a, a copy of that file on your computer in your own personal files, so then you can just delete it from the Zoom storage. Absolutely. All right, so classroom equipment. The first thing you should know about the classrooms is that everything you need to know about classrooms is at go.niu.edu slash classrooms. This is the Division of IT's website where they have been uh, posting new information and sharing more resources. In fact, I took this screenshot just a week ago. You'll actually find, if I move my browser over, that there are already more resources available here than what was available a week ago. I just didn't update the screenshot. So here at the live website, a few things I want to point out to you. One is that there's a dashboard of classrooms that are currently being upgraded. So you can check the dashboard to view the status of your current classroom to see what type of an upgrade it was receiving and what the status is, if it's complete or incomplete. But I think the more helpful tool is actually Find My Classroom here at the bottom. And with Find My Classroom, you can search for the room you are teaching in, and you'll see the inventory of the room that you are teaching. So could someone maybe in the text chat give me the, the room and room number for one of the classrooms that you'll be teaching in this fall? All right, Anderson 247 from someone. We'll look up that one first. So look up AN 247. 
AN247 is, has these items as their inventory. So you can make a mental note. We'll talk about some of these, um, particularly the, the camera, webcam. We'll talk quite a bit about cameras in a minute. Uh, and Linda, you shared DuSable 452. Look at that one next. So here's the equipment that will be in DuSable 452. I would strongly encourage going to the classroom website, checking your own inventory uh, for that classroom so that you get a sense of what's available and what um, will be in the room when you walk into it on Monday or at some point next week. Here, I also want to point out there are um, links for each room to view training and support and to check the installation status. The check install status opens the dashboard, view training and support, links to a page where we have some um, videos of using the classrooms. There's also a link in the menu for training guides. These training guides are uh, pages about some of the specific technology or tools that you may be using. So with that in mind, you can use this website as your, your go-to place to start with to find out what will be in your classroom. The other thing I want to point out at this page that's really useful is this button to submit an incident or request a service. If you're in a classroom and there's a technical issue with uh, a camera or equipment that's, so something's not working, something is missing, Right now, the best approach to resolve that is to submit a ticket for the Division of IT to look into. It unfortunately won't resolve the issue for that class session, but it is the way that you can, the best way to communicate right now with the Division of IT for any issues in those classrooms. So here's another example of classroom equipment. I used AB100, uh, which is in the art building. Here's another view of the equipment that is in, uh, the, of the inventory that might be in a room. This was a previous iteration when the classroom equipment was a spreadsheet on the website. Now it's searchable and it's at the bottom of that web page. Much easier to use. In general, these are not official, it's not official categorization, but it's sort of the way that I think about classrooms. We have essentially four basic types of classrooms. We do have some rooms that have no technology. Those don't have a computer, they don't have a projector. They are primarily used for things like seminars, for art studios, places where um, the, that, that are not very lecture oriented, certainly. Uh, those rooms are not going to be effective for live streaming, although you could manage to live stream by bringing in a laptop or by using your phone. We have others that have a computer, but no projector. These are primarily, the computer is intended primarily for streaming. That means that with the computer, usually on a cart, you can use the computer to live stream what is going on in the classroom to remote students, but you aren't going to be using the computer for displaying a PowerPoint, for example, for your in-person students, because there's no projector <laughs> to enlarge that display for students. The vast majority of our classrooms have a computer and a projector that might occur on a traditional podium, a, an instructor station with a lectern maybe, or in some of the rooms this is actually on a mobile cart, um, usually because it's a temporary solution or it's brought into a room for one class and removed for others. But with a computer and a projector you can both stream as long as there's a microphone and you can project for students in the room. And then a number of our classrooms, an increasingly number, increasing number of classrooms, have an interactive flat panel display. This is a large monitor, usually mounted on the wall or on a cart, that is touch screen. And it may or may not be connected to a computer because these interactive flat panel displays are, for one, they're basically a large tablet, like an Android tablet, so you can run software directly on the display. Or you can also wirelessly broadcast from your own laptop or smartphone to display that on the monitor. So many of them do have a computer connected, some of them don't, but you can use them for, for live streaming in either case. In what we think of, or what I think of as a typical classroom, many of them have a classroom control at the front instructor station. The left side, the, the um, the LCD display 
is a more upgraded room. The one on the right that still says media services because that's the uh, predecessor who took care of classrooms has a, a physical button box. In many classrooms, this is how you turn on the projector in the room. And then you can also use this to change what is being sent to the projector. So for example, in the picture here to the left, if I clicked laptop in this top row of buttons, now the laptop will be projected for my students, assuming I've connected a laptop to the, um, probably an HDMI cable in the room. Whereas on the right, I would click the, like the dock cam button, and now the document camera would be on the projector. Each of the rooms is going to have either, I mean, no camera, or one of these four styles of camera. If there's a camera in the room, it will be one of these four. And the classroom inventory will tell you which of the four types of um, of cameras will be in your room. We have some that will just say webcam. That's going to be this traditional webcam. So if your if your inventory just says webcam, what you'll have is a type of webcam that would be connected to your computer and sit on top of your monitor. Those are um, face one direction at a time. They do have a built-in microphone. We'll talk more about these capabilities in a minute. Um, very few of our, our classrooms right now have what's called a PTZ camera or a pan tilt zoom. These are usually ceiling mounted, so they're actually upside down from the way I have this right here, uh, and can be directed to specific uh, areas of the classroom, usually by using the, uh, the touch screen LCD display that I just showed. Most of our classrooms are going to have either the webcam, though, or a meeting owl or a desktop 360 camera. And so we should talk about what the capabilities of those specific tools are. I have, I took some screenshots, we took some photos of what a meeting owl looks like and what a desktop 360 camera looks like. So in both of these, both of these cases, if your classroom inventory says Meeting Owl or Desktop 360, this is the the um, the camera views that you would have from those. You notice that there's a, there are 360, both of them, so you have a 360 degree view of the camera, and then they also have focused, <clears throat> excuse me, or action views that show more of what's going on in that classroom space. These are similar cameras, but they're not identical. A meeting owl, so these are meeting owl here, desktop 360 camera there. The meeting owl camera is motion and voice activated. So it will focus on wherever the sound is coming from. If you're talking, it'll focus on you. If you walk across the room, it will. there's a delay, but it will follow you in order to continue to focus on you for your remote students. And then if more than one person talks, it will automatically choose to split the, the camera view and show more than one person. The desktop 360 camera, which the brand that we're using is called a J5 Create, the, the desktop 360 camera has six different display modes, but they are manual. So you can choose what you want your remote students' uh, view of the camera to be. Once you've set it, you can then continue to teach as you normally would. Uh, and you can change this on the fly. So if you wanted to start with a, a view just of you, then you wanted to switch to maybe the full 360 um, so that students could see everyone, uh, you can switch back and forth as you go with a mode button that is on top of the camera. We're going to pivot to microphones as well. So. If you're using the Meeting Owl, the Webcam, or the J5 Create, the microphone is integrated into each of those tools. So you would be using the same device for both your camera and your microphone. If you're using a PTZ camera, um, then you would be using the wireless microphone instead to pick you up. Um, the Samson here is not the version that we're actually using. It was the what I thought of as the most uh, <laughs> 
maybe typical looking wireless lapel microphone that I found. You will find wireless microphones in a lot of classrooms where they're not actually used for streaming, they're used for amplification. So in our larger lecture halls, uh, Cole 100, for example, is a great example where Cole 100 uses a meeting owl camera. And so for streaming, you're using the meeting owl as your camera and your microphone. But Cole 100 also has wireless microphones because it's a very large lecture hall and you need the students at the back of the room to be able to hear you. So in that case, the wireless microphone is used for to make yourself louder for the students in the room and you would end up using both pin on the, the wireless microphone, but also in your web conferencing tool, you would turn on the meeting owl for uh, picking up the sound in the room. The other way that I, I think about these microphones is in thinking about how uh, what they're actually going to pick up. So the the ones on the left, the webcam or with a PTZ camera and a wireless microphone, those really only pick up the instructor. And so students will hear you better than they hear anyone else in the room. If you're using a Meeting Owl or a J5 Create, the Desktop 360 camera, those microphones have about a 20 foot pickup range. That's not going to be perfect for a larger lecture hall to pick up students who are all the way at the back but they will pick up those who are uh, closer to the room, the front of the room. So like I said, about a 20 foot pickup range uh, to easily pick up a discussion of all of the students. In a small seminar or uh, discussion class, these are a great way to seamlessly broadcast or record the conversation. You're not passing microphones around. Um, it, will, it will simply pick up everyone who is within that range and either broadcast or record it or both, depending on what you've set up. Many of the rooms also will say that they have a desktop digital whiteboard. And the desktop digital whiteboard has a pen. I tried to circle here where that pen is. In this case, it's some of these, they're kind of magneted to the bottom of the, the pen display. In other cases, you may find it attached via a cable sitting on the desktop, or they may be under the desktop, like sitting on top of the computer or near the lapel microphones. But these pens turn the monitor into a whiteboard so that you can write on it instead of using the marker board in class. Uh, there are a lot of, I think, great benefits to using a digital whiteboard, but specifically when you're live streaming, the digital whiteboard, the, the cameras don't pick up the marker board very well. The PTZ camera would, but again, those are in very few of our classrooms right now. So the if you're trying to use the dry erase board, the marker board in your class when you're teaching and you're live streaming, your student's remote won't be able to see what's on the marker board. Whereas if you use the digital whiteboard, you can project that for your students and broadcast it to your remote students so everyone can see the same writing. So you would use the pen and you literally just then write on the screen. I'm doing this with my mouse and the, the annotation tools in PowerPoint so I'm not very good with writing with my mouse. Um, but you can use that then in conjunction with a whiteboard in, um, in your web conferencing tool. Blackboard Collaborate, Zoom and Teams all have an integrated whiteboard or you can use it with other applications that allow annotation, like PowerPoint. Um, you can see here at the bottom of PowerPoint that I have this toolbar of tools. The one here that's lit up in, in white um, is the, the pen tools, and I've used that some today as well to annotate over my PowerPoint. You can also then use the annotation, the pen writing in something like OneNote. It's a great way to write some notes and then save those to distribute to students as well. That's, I think, pretty typical representative of the equipment you'll find in a classroom. Um, I, I will tell you that while there are some document cameras in classrooms, many of them are not functioning. 
some of that is because those document cameras are very old and the the device itself isn't functioning. Some of that has to do with how uh, they've had to wire them in order to add live streaming capabilities. So the document camera may be connected to the projector but not to the computer for broadcasting. If you do have a document camera and you want to share that with your students, you would look for, you would need to share it as a camera for one, and then you would share either an Enogeni, I-N-O-G-E-N-I, or a Mirabox, M-I-R-A-B-O-X. And those would be what you would see as a camera if you were able to, um, if the document camera was connected to the computer. So in your own classroom, try that out. Turn on the document camera, start your web conferencing tool, see if you can find either of those two devices as a camera, and then just see what it looks like to make sure that what you're picking up, that the image you're picking up is visible uh, in the web conferencing tool. Before we go on to managing a hybrid classroom, I noticed a few other comments. Laurel commented that in their first week of teaching, the HEPA filters that are in the classrooms are very loud and can create audio challenges. And then Bob agreed. Yes, you'll find in many of the classrooms sort of red box fans that have a filter on them. Those are HEPA filters. Those are meant to ensure airflow and filter the air for, for health and safety in the classrooms. I, I agree. They are very loud. That poses two problems. One is for yourself to project over them for your students to hear you and or hear each other in the classroom but then also for live streaming those do particularly with the um, the integrated microphones in the meeting owl or in the desktop 360 camera the the air filters are very loud and those pick up such a broad open range of sound that can cause an audio challenge for remote students as well um, unfortunately I don't have a great solution in order to address that but um, what, certainly trying to keep the filter as far away from the camera as possible is the first strategy. And then actually Laurel mentioned another one that's a great strategy, which is to have the students in the room log into Zoom on their own computers or collaborate or Teams, whatever you're using, and then have them mute and unmute their own um, devices so that their camera, or their microphone rather, on their laptop is what picks up their sound for the remote students to hear. You have to be a little careful with that because if they unmute their microphone, that's going to be broadcast on the room speakers and that can cause a feedback loop. So you'll want to um, mute your own microphone on the instructor station when they're speaking for the best results. But yes, you have to mute your computer when they speak. Um, but that is a great strategy for students to pick up themselves and their laptop microphone right in front of them will pick them up better than the distance, the microphones at a distance. You also don't necessarily need every student to have a microphone. If a student doesn't happen to have a laptop with them one day, they could maybe speak loud enough for their neighbor's laptop to pick them up. Um, and that will and continue to improve the, the audio quality for your recording and for your remote students. But in general, strategies for trying to teach this way um, are, are necessary for the sake of your own, uh, your own energy. It's really draining, honestly, to try to manage two sets of students at once. So I have a couple of, of tips for thinking about from the very beginning. Uh, one is with students who are remote, they're likely to feel disconnected and their experience is going to be very different than the students in the classroom. So I encourage you to think about how you can deliberately try to include them in the classroom community, either during the live class session or using digital tools like a discussion board, and how you think about equity for those students as well. If they're not able to be in the classroom, how can you and we know that you know separate but equal is is not valid. How do we help them to to have a sense of of equitable experience um, and make their experiences make make sure that they are they're getting a a good experience even though they can't be in the classroom. The second strategy is thinking about using digital tools instead of handing out paper in class or using the marker board. We talked about the the digital marker board already or digital whiteboard on the monitor, but we'll talk about a couple of other strategies for digital tools. 
You can also use either a TA if you have one or if you don't, volunteers from the students in the class to be a liaison with remote students. So if a student in the class signs into the session as well, they can help for your sake monitor whether the camera is on, they can help answer, ask questions that someone online posted to the text chat, or they can let you know if students remotely aren't able to hear you. Uh, and so that helps instead of you trying to manage all of the technology, that having another student volunteer who can assist with that helps to take that workload off of you in that real time. I also recommend if you have a class that's longer than about an hour to take more frequent breaks. For one, it's, uh, it's exhausting to teach in a mask. So you are going to be more tired, your students are going to be more tired, and taking a break so that anyone who needed to go outside and remove their mask could do so is really helpful. But it also allows you to check in with students who are remote. It gives a chance for students who are remote to get up and walk away from their computer. A three-hour class sitting at the, the monitor staring at um, the, a Zoom session, for example, is very draining and fatiguing as well. If you don't have great audio pickup in class, I recommend if a student asks a question, repeating that for the remote students. It's not a great solution in a highly discussion-based course, but if, it, if your course is more lecture-based, then this gives you a way to make sure that the remote students have heard the questions from the in-person students. And then if you don't have a, a TA or a student volunteer who can help be the liaison with your remote students, you can also sign into the session on a second laptop or, or your smartphone and use that as a confidence monitor so that you can see what your remote students are seeing and you can see their text chat, you can see their videos even potentially um, to manage the two audiences more seamlessly. When you're preparing class for class though, you can help set yourself up for success by thinking about your remote students as you make your plans and you make your preparation. So when you're planning an activity uh, or when you're planning a, a lecture, for example, think about your remote students and how or whether they'll be able to see what you're doing or listen to the what you're doing. Can they hear a video that you're playing, for example? Can they see the artifact, the object you brought to class to, to demonstrate something? And how will they be able to do that? When you're planning more active learning, activities, group work to be done in class, plan ahead and think about how your remote students are going to be able to participate. That might be participating directly in the activity, it might be participating as a group themselves if you have more than one students online, or they might participate by observing and reacting. So if they can't actively participate in the discussion or in the the activity in real time, perhaps they can observe and then reflect and share their reaction to that either directly to you or to the class at large. And then also think about what value they get from watching what's going on in class. If there's um, some administrative things you're doing in class that the remote students uh, that doesn't pertain to the remote students, think about either having a uh, step in class early to do that within in-person and let the online students sign off or stop the recording if you're recording and not broadcasting so that the online students don't end up um, sitting through something that they're not getting any value from. And then I mentioned one of the, the first strategies is thinking about using digital tools instead of paper or the marker board. So let's talk about some of those digital tools. Certainly in class, you may have had students do um, a, a round of introductions the first day. When you do that, have your virtual students come on microphone and introduce themselves. Or consider taking those off, up, they're not offline, but out of the synchronous time and having all of your students give virtual introductions via a discussion board or using a video-based tool like VoiceThread or Flipgrid. With VoiceThread, students could create a few slides about themselves and record narration over those using a webcam, using a microphone, or using their telephone. They can actually call a phone number. Or with Flipgrid, students record a short video with their webcam or the camera on their smartphone to introduce themselves, say hello, and, and talk about who they are, why they're in the classroom, that sort of thing. When you are 
having discussion in class, then there are a couple of different ways that you could have your remote students participate. During that live class session, your remote students could use their microphones to speak up during class. Uh, depending on the size of the room, depending on the type of discussion, it may be difficult for them to, to break in naturally themselves. So you may want to have them raise their hand in the, the class session online so that you could, uh, you could make space for them to join the discussion. Oh, I saw we had a question online. Let's take a minute. You know, Jane, could you please share your comment or join our discussion? Uh, they could post comments in the text chats. They could have their own essentially back channel asynchronous discussion, or well, synchronous discussion rather, using text in the text chat to, to comment and discuss and share that then a student liaison or you could check in and read out for the in-person students. Or logged into Zoom, as, as Laurel wow. mentioned, then you could use the text chat in the web conferencing tool as a back channel so that your in-class students and your remote students could all participate in that discussion in the text chat at the same time. If it's challenging for students to participate in, in those live discussions while they're remote, or if you're recording and not broadcasting, then a couple of strategies you might use are to have students post comments that they would have made in class during the discussion to either a discussion board where all of the students could see those or to a journal. So it's a private reflection basically for them to share with you. You could have them reflect using Flipgrid or VoiceThread or any other uh, video audio tool to record their own reflection or their own thoughts on the discussion question. Or you could have them summarize or provide a, a counterpoint or a counter argument to the discussion that happened in class and share it with their classmates. This is equivalent to um, sort of a fishbowl activity where someone observes but doesn't participate and then reacts to that, reflects upon what happened, makes a point that wasn't made at the time, or, or even uses that as sort of a a reflection or an evaluation of the discussion and of the discussion behaviors that they observed. That's particularly useful if you're teaching things like discussion habits or negotiation or debate, argument, critical thinking for the students who are remote to perhaps not participate, but instead offer their observations of how that discussion went uh, in real time. We also have a great tool called Yellow Dig. If you're not familiar with Yellow Dig, it's really an alternative to the, the Blackboard built-in discussion board. And it, it rewards what we would consider more positive community behaviors. So the a standard discussion board is really built for, for pretty basic threaded discussion. You post once, you respond twice. Um, and they're, they're kind of dry and static sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. In Yellow Dig, Yellow Dig automates grading. So you don't have to actually grade it if you're using this for points. And it promotes more autonomy for students, more self-direction in choosing what to discuss, how to discuss, and when to discuss. It becomes a, a facilitating process and activity as opposed to a, a summative assessment of what they they know when what they shared. So Yellow Dig rewards them for things like, for things that promote community, promote conversation, promote discussion. Um, for example, for posting early, they, they can earn more points towards their, their quota for the week by posting early and having others respond to them. They get more points if they posted something interesting that gets more responses and reaction. And they get points as well for responding to each other, encouraging each other, and again, forming more of that, that community orientation. So this could supplement your in-person discussions, or it could replace an online discussion board, or it could be a back channel where students converse um, outside of class or during class in order to, uh, to have more conversation and more discussion. So if you're interested in Yellow Dig, uh, it's a really interesting tool. We added it last fall with a few pilot participants, but it's open now to all NIU faculty. 
You also want to find ways that you can check for understanding and allow students to practice more actively what they're learning in your class. There are, again, a lot of ways to do that. Discussion is, is certainly one of the ways that we, use, that we do that. But if you have, um, if normally you would have more uh, problem-based practice, for example, then you might try a tool like Kahoot, Poll Everywhere, or Microsoft Forms that are almost mini interactive quizzes. So with Kahoot, students can play a short quiz game, and your students in person and remote can both join the same Kahoot session and participate together. If you have a smaller class, you could use the free version of Poll Everywhere. It is limited to, I believe, 40 responses, but you could have students in person and remote answer the same survey questions and then display those results a question at a time as students answer them. And then with Microsoft Forms, it's a really quick, easy to use survey tool in O365. It's a little less interactive. You would build a survey, have students answer the questions, but then you could share those results anonymously and talk about the responses that, that students gave uh, when, you, when they answered that form. If you have all the students logged in, you could also use, logged into uh, your Zoom or Collaborate or Team session, you could also use polling in the session to ask questions and get answers uh, for, for problems or for getting their opinions on things. In that case, I would build those questions into your PowerPoint presentation and then just pause and launch a poll for students to answer them in real time. If you have students who would be doing performances, giving presentations, holding debates, then your remote students, again, may have some difficulty participating in that live. They could. You could have them present from, uh, again, Collaborate, Teams, Zoom, using their video, sharing their content. You can absolutely do that really well for remote presentations. It's also a great way, by the way, for um, remote speakers anyhow. But if you would prefer not to try to do those live, there are a variety of ways that students can perform or re record their performance or representation in order to show that with their to their classmates. And then you can host a virtual film festival where you screen those in class, or you can have students watch those outside of class to comment on, rate, or, or um, discuss those. And then again, I've listed a lot of potential tools for having students create those recordings. Uh, Kaltura has some, VoiceThread has tools, and then there are a lot of other tools available that allow you to record some sort of video or animation that are available free, but again, usually with limitations on what features are available. Before we get to some final thoughts, and I definitely want you to have time to ask questions about your own classrooms, about your own strategies, when you're using technology like this, there will be some limitations. You will need backup plans. So Laurel has already mentioned the, the impact of the HEPA filters in the classrooms. That's a limitation of using microphones that pick up a broader range of sound. Um, you're going to pick up more background noise. So let's talk about some of the limitations and what backup plans you might use. I also want to point out that on the, um, the I believe it's in the training resources on the Classrooms website, there is a quick guide here for backup plans for classroom streaming. So beyond what we're going to talk about today, there's a, a whole guide here with other strategies, additional strategies that you might use in the case of a, a technical issue in your classroom. So again, that was at the classroom, go.niu.edu slash classrooms. That's where I landed first. I went to classroom training resources. And at the bottom of that page was the button to get to backup plans. But for those of you in the session, I'll put the link also directly in the chat. So some of those limitations or backup plans you might need. You may come into a room and there's no microphone. Either the, maybe you're in a room that, that uses those PTZ cameras and there isn't another microphone available or you can't find the microphone or for some reason it's just not working. For students to be able to hear you, then you need a backup plan to broadcast that audio. 
couple of options. One actually uses the strategy Laurel's already shared, which is if you instead sign in via your laptop or perhaps your smartphone, you can turn on your microphone there and use that as your audio instead of a classroom microphone. Obviously, you can do this. Your students can do this as well. So if the streaming can't pick up either you or your students, using a device as with an integrated microphone is probably the, the first and easiest backup plan. The other one, though, particularly if you are uh, trying to connect audio to the instructor station, if you are someone who lectures more than, than holds discussion, is to dial in via telephone. So all three of these tools have an option for tele joining the web conference via phone instead of via your computer. And so you can dial in via telephone, carry your, your smartphone around then as your microphone while you're in the session. And then the students who are remote can hear you. The downside to this is the students who are remote, their audio would then come to your phone instead of to the instructor station. So the in-class students wouldn't be able to hear you, hear them, but they would be able to hear you. And if you used your phone on speakerphone, you could probably mitigate that even quite a bit too. If you're in a room that has no camera, or you're in a room that has a traditional webcam as opposed to the one of the 360 cams or the PTZ cameras. Your first option is to hold class with no video. Uh, as long as what you are trying to show or demonstrate isn't uh, doesn't require the camera, if you're going to be using something that's more computer-based, uh, so you need audio and maybe your screen share, you could just forego video. That makes things a little bit more complicated. Uh, video makes things more complicated. And so streaming without or recording without the video isn't going to ruin your class session. If you do have something that students who are remote need to be able to see a demonstration or an artifact, then um, I would recommend recording that in advance and posting it to Kaltura. You could still show that video live, but by recording it and then showing that in class, your students in person and your students who are remote can both watch that at the same time. You could then have students watch it outside of class time as well, but recording it then means that not having a camera doesn't mean that your remote students are going to miss out on seeing that demonstration or seeing that equipment or seeing that artifact. For something that um, is more static, for example, if you had a uh, an artifact that you wanted students to see, you could just take a photo of it and put that into a PowerPoint slide even. And then with the traditional webcam, you really need to probably sit or stand behind the instructor station for you to be seen. A webcam, none of the webcams are locked down. They're not taped or glued or secured in any way. So you can also move the webcam and reposition it if you wanted students, if you wanted to face it out to the classroom, for example, or instead of behind the instructor station, you wanted to kind of point towards the front of the room so you could wander. Uh, you can reposition a traditional webcam fairly easily. Uh, but if there's really no camera, then I would try one of these other options first. Any questions at this point? Um, I'll, I'll give you some a few minutes to think about those with my, my last final thoughts. Again, less is more. Start with what you can do. Try to add to that over time. Um, and remember that you don't have to live stream unless you know that your class was set up for both in-person and online students to register. Live streaming is, is really helpful. It's a way for us to meet the needs of our students where and when they are. Uh, but if, you, if you're teaching a class that is fully in-person and you have one student who now has a medical reason why they can't be in class for a few weeks or the rest of the semester, Live streaming is one tool, one option for you, but there are other ways that you can help that student meet the learning objectives and continue their, their education for the class. There, you may not need to implement full live streaming for, a, for one or maybe two students. You might meet with them individually. You might uh, find additional resources for them. There are other ways for them to meet those objectives than live streaming. That being said, if you are live streaming, 
it is really rich and there's an energy to having students who might not have been able to take your course joining the the conversation via live streaming and if you can think about the transformation from fully in person or fully remote to this this hybrid you can really create a, a course experience that is the best of both worlds that meets all of your students needs and is flexible in a way that uh, is very student centered with that don't forget about go.niu.edu slash classrooms if you're looking for an update on where whether your classroom is updated the Believe it or not, the classroom team is still updating classrooms all weekend to try to have everything ready by Monday. They're confident they'll do it, but your room may not be ready yet. You can also check the inventory of classrooms on that page. That will tell you what will be in your classroom by Monday. If you go today and the classroom isn't done on the dashboard, you may not see that equipment yet, but it will be there on Monday when you arrive. And then lastly, don't forget about the flexible teaching guides and the guide to hybrid course delivery at flexteaching.niu.edu. That is a wrap on what I had for you. Now is a great time to post a question to the text chat or raise your hand if you have a question. We are also, I realize, at the end of the hour. So if you do need to leave or you have no questions, I want to thank you for joining and, and wish you a happy Friday. <laughs>